It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 296 of Science on Top. Today is Wednesday, the 16th of May, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And a senior research fellow at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research, Dr. Carolyn DeGraff. Welcome. Hi. Nice to be here with you guys. It's great to have you with us. Uh, but before we get started, if you can want to help us make the show, you can go to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledge to support us on Patreon. You get to choose the level that you want to contribute and that gets you different rewards. We are really grateful to everyone who puts in and helps us out. Carolyn, as I said, it's great to have you with us today. Do you want to tell us a bit about what it is you actually do at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute? Um, so I'm interested in the genetics of blood cell development. So how hematopoietic stem cells, so they're the stem cells that can make all the different kinds of blood, um, turn into the 10 different lineages that we have. So in your blood, you've got red cells which carry oxygen around, you've got platelets that clot, and you've got white cells that can respond um, to different infections. And you've got to keep turning these over every day. Um, and so there's a lot of genetic changes that go from being a stem cell to being these um, different mature cell types. And so at the moment, I'm studying this using single cell sequencing. So it used to be that if you wanted to know um, which genes were turned on in a cell, you had to take a pool of thousands or even millions of cells of cells um, to work out what genes were in them. And this is kind of like trying to understand the difference between a strawberry and a pineapple by taking a fruit salad and turning it into a smoothie and looking at that. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what we have now is you can kind of pluck out individual bits of the fruit salad and see which genes are turned on in those. So this is one of the things I really love about working in the genomics field is that there's new stuff coming happening coming out all the time. So single cell sequencing is a pretty recent development. And the trick behind it is you take um, all the transcripts in the cell. So these are all the genes that are turned on that are RNA. And you stick a unique uh, DNA barcode sequence to the end of it. And so this means all the genes in one cell have this um, tag. That means then you can pull together thousands of cells and then rather than doing thousands of individual reactions, you can just do one reaction with them all together and pull them for sequencing. And later, then you can separate them into which cell they came from based on this barcode. Right. Yeah, so it's a pretty nifty trick here. And so, yeah, I'm using it to try and work out, um, can we divide further some of the different blood cell types that we have? What do you mean by divide further? That we've got these, um, for the groups I'm interested in, there's uh, granulocytes. These are white blood cells which have granules in them, which they release um, upon seeing pathogens or different chemicals they don't like. Um, this can help both kill the pathogen or summon assistance from the rest of the immune system. And there's a few different kinds of these, neutrophils, eosinophils, mast cells, um, but within these major types, I'm interested in can we get a bit more granularity um, that will help, uh, that maybe have slightly different functions that might be important for response to particular diseases or in particular situations. Okay. So sort of a way of like what, what, what would you be doing, inducing the body to create certain cells or actually taking the cells out and dividing them yourselves and... Well, with, in pre-inserting them. Well, with the single cell sequencing, you can just take out um, the pool of them and then work out if there are different groups. And so we have, we're kind of at the stage we've worked out that there is, um, uh, there are some more groups than we knew that were there before. And we're now trying to set up some experiments to see um, if in particular diseases, one group will respond more than the other group. 
And perhaps if we subdivide okay. further and remove that one group, do we get a different response? Um, so this is kind of like, you know, cool. a fun stage of it that we, you know, we've found these things out and we're now seeing if they will, if they make any difference, what these groups are. The fun stage. I love it. <laughs> uh, I really find it's a lot of fun stages. And the other, yeah, there's another uh, project I'm working on with this sequencing where we're looking at different blood cells across um, evolutionary time. So we're comparing the blood cells that you can find in mammals to the blood cells that you have in uh, chickens and sharks and lampreys and fish. And so with these different species, it's really you can't even divide them into those 10 different groups in the ways we do for mammals because we normally do that by different surface antibodies against different surface molecules. And these haven't been found um, for what makes um, a neutrophil in a shark. But instead, we can just take um, all their blood, sequence that, and then just later decide which kind of cell they were based on which genes are in them. All right. So again, distinguishing the parts of that fruit salad, but in a different organism. Yeah, and then we can see that once we've decided something is a cell that expresses granules, we can see if the granules are made up in the same way. You know, if they've got all the same components that we would see in the equivalent of the mammal cell, or if there are different things right. or new things added. Right. So, how did they necessarily develop evolutionary compared to in a mammal or something like that? Yes, because we've got a pretty good idea already of which genes are conserved um, between different species, because you know every you can already we've got the full genome of these um, species, but we don't know which cells that these genes are turned on or off in. And so using this technique, we can find out if the sets of genes are expressed as a set um, in the same way in a shark as they are in a human. Oh, okay. So so like a shark neutrophil might express genes A, B, C, D, E, and then a human one might be A, B, C, F, G or something. So the genes may or may not work together. Is that? Yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. the idea, that there'll be parts missing. Mm -hmm. Or that, you know, there could be parts missing or that something that's really only found in one particular cell in mammals, maybe yeah. it's expressed in all the different blood cells mm -hmm. um, in a shark. And so I guess to do this, you'd be kind of building like a database of all the different blood cells that you come across. Um, is that right? So you would then be able to identify each one across all sorts of species and yes. different organisms. So this is actually has been kind of a long-standing project of the lab that we've been interested in doing. And actually this has kind of progressed over different um, genomic technologies um, as they've evolved. We started doing it a number of years ago um, using microarrays, which you don't even sequence the genes um, in a cell. You take it and hybridise the DNA onto a chip kind of using the property of DNA, um, that it's a, a double helix that, you know, one half binds to another half. So if you have a piece of DNA on a chip, the opposite sequence will come along and bind to that. And then if you tag that um, with a fluorescent molecule, you can see how much of the fluorescent molecule binds to each particular sequence. So something that's really bright, there'd be lots of copies of it in that cell type. Um, Okay. But to do that, you have to know which genes you're interested in looking at um, because if you didn't know what it was, you wouldn't have it on the chip. So we've now moved, we've now moved on to um, where you just sequence all the DNA in the pool of cells, and that's great because you didn't have to know what was there to do it, um, which is particularly okay. good for the species um, which are less well studied. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of see... On similar uh, creatures, there might be these particular cells or whatever, so you can then you don't have to study that individual again. Is that what you mean, sort of thing? So it's common throughout different species. Yeah, well, more I say is that um, I guess people have been have done lots of work on um, mouse and human genes, so they've got a really good idea of um, the types of, of where the genes are in the genome. But if you go to something like a shark, there are a lot less people interested in sharks. And so they have uh, yep. both a poor idea of what the overall genome looks like and then an even scantier idea of which parts of the genome are genes. 
and so which bits are likely to be turned on. Right. This is very cool stuff. And I think, as, as you say, there's a lot of new technologies sort of burgeoning in this field. It's, it's kind of a, a, a big data thing in the end because, uh, you know, we talked about the uh, Human Genome Project and how that has given us a wealth of information. But as you say, we can then sort of build these profiles of not an entire organism necessarily, but even just the different blood types and the blood cells of lots and lots and lots of different animals like I said, it's it's big data. It's very cool. Yeah, I mean, this is, I guess, the way that it's doing. So at least for different um, blood cell types, we've, be, we've created a database in our lab, which we've um, now made available to the rest of the research community of all the uh, different blood cell types, and we've been adding to this over the years. Um, so I think this has been pretty useful for people, particularly since our lab works on some of the, I guess, less studied cells. Um and so there haven't been these resources available before. So people right. on rare granular sites or the cells involved in clotting, which are difficult to purify, come to our database and get the information about which genes are turned on in these cells. Very cool. And this kind of brings us to um, our first story, actually, which is about the studies recently published by Harvard researchers who have systematically profiled every cell in developing zebrafish and I think it was frog embryos, essentially showing how one cell develops into an entire organism, right? Yeah, I thought this was a really cool study. Again, it would have been impossible to do a couple of years ago because they've done this um, with the single cell sequencing. So what they've done is they've taken both of the species, the frog and the fish, and they've um, collected the embryos at many different time points across the first day of development. And then they've tagged all the different cells. Now, I think they did this to nearly 200,000 cells. So this is a pretty big experiment. And when they mm. uh, interviewed one of the senior authors from the paper, he was saying that you know this would have been many, many years of work um, in the past to do this kind of thing. Mm. And now you could just do it in a day. Um, <laughs> but, but that's important when you're dealing with the life cycle of things that you know develop from a single cell or an egg into an entire or organism in a matter of days or something, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, frogs and I kind of looked it up when I was looking into this um, story, and frogs and fish develop particularly quickly. So I think human embryos, it takes about four days before they get past um, the 16 cell stage, whereas fish by the end of the 20 foot, first 24 hours, they have something that's semi-recognisable as a fish, um, which is wow. quite different. So there's a little tail and, you know, there's a head and you can kind of tell which end they're at. Yeah, because I was actually wondering if there was a significance to the 24 hours. Like, I guess it's different in different species, but like, is that when, because obviously, like, surely the fate of every single body every single cell in my body now, you know, it depends on if I've had a cut or what I've eaten or something. But when it's, I don't know what I'm quite saying, when it's not as programmed or like, like okay, we've got all these cell groups now and they're not going to turn into something different? Like, Yeah, I think in the, for at least for these species, yeah. uh, for these time points, there is quite a programmed set of development yeah. um, over this time. Mm-hmm. I mean, once you get things like, you know, hearts working and things like that, things are mixing up a bit more. Mm. I mean, it's not quite as programmed as um, C. elegans, one of the model worms yeah. people, work, where they know that there's, I think it's 1,092 cells or something very close to that, in the, in, you know, exactly, in the mature um, organism. And yeah, so, how that map, you know, yeah, like every connection of every neuron in that or something, I thought. Yes, yes, they mapped every neuron in a, yeah, the little nematode yeah. worm. Yeah, so frogs oh, cool. and fish are kind of the, you know, the next level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one day humans. One day, oh, God. <laughs> well. I mean, that's one of the nice things. That's, I think one of the cool things that's coming out of this is that now they've got recipes of like how you turn um, an embryonic stem cell mm. into a neuron. And so they know which genes have to go on and which genes have to go off, um, how long this has to be for and which order. And so you can start to work out, so if we wanted to regenerate some tissues, this is the program we would have to go through to do this. Hmm. So I guess you could end up 
in the long term looking for um, developmental things that are not happening and going, right, well, these aren't being produced. This type of cell isn't. We need to do something to develop more of this sort of thing. It's like a diagnostic and a treatment thing at a cellular level. Yeah, so if I guess if you know 100% of what's going on in a cell, mm. it does make the diagnosis a lot easier. Exciting things. And like I said, it's, I love this sort of big data, this technology coming together to increase the efficiency and the speed at which we can do stuff like this. It's very awesome. Well, let's move on and talk about the 81-year-old James Harrison, a man who has saved the lives of around 2.4 million babies, which is a good thing to have on your CV. Penny, why was his blood literally worth bottling? His blood is pretty special. It contains um, the anti-D antibody. And this is really important because it can protect um, unborn babies from... um, well, I've always called it anti-D, but apparently it's called rhesus D hemolytic disease. And this disease happens, um, I think a lot of people know their blood type. You know, you might be AB positive or O negative or A negative. So there's the A, the B, the O. But what is important here is the positive or negative. So my blood type is A negative. And that means I don't have these antigens on my blood cells. I feel like I feel a bit embarrassed explaining this in front of Kara because I'm certainly not expert on blood. <laughs> so feel free to jump in if I've got it wrong. But my husband, and I remember finding this out during pregnancy, is um, positive. And I remember thinking, oh, sh- uh-oh, <laughs> because <laughs> I knew what that meant. And it meant that it was fine in my first pregnancy. But once some of the fetuses, and the fetus is I found out we found out there was a genetic test for various reasons that he was um, he had a double positive. So no matter what, I knew that my children will all have a positive blood type. Um, so what that means is at the end of the pregnancy, when you're giving birth, inevitably there's bleeding, there's tearing, it's messy, it's not fun, and some of the fetus's blood will make contact with my blood. And so my child was safely out, but my body produced. Um, antibodies against these positive rhesus antigens. So in the next pregnancy, what would happen is inevitably there's a little bit of leakage and essentially my body would go, oh my gosh, there's something foreign in here. We don't want it. Get rid of it, which is usually a great thing for your immune system to do, but not when that thing is a baby that you want. So this man, James Harrison, um, his blood actually contains the anti-D antibody. So what that means is after um, you give birth to the first baby, you can, and I had this, an injection of this anti-D serum and essentially it just, as far as I understand, wipes out all those um, antigens and antibodies so your body doesn't learn that immune response. And so my next pregnancy, instead of ending in heartbreak, ended in a child it's it's really really quite an amazing treatment and what I also found amazing is I was a blood donor and I really should get back to it reading this story has made me think what are you doing not that my blood's anything special (laughs) is that um, Mr Harrison has been donating for 60 years he's made over a thousand blood donations that is just amazing so he's been allowed to continue you know way over the um, the age that he would usually that people would usually be allowed to donate blood but eventually the blood bank has made the you know the assessment it's not worth risking his health for this um, mm. but it's just it's quite amazing apparently every little bit of anti D ever made in Australia probably has a bit of his blood his blood contains a, a combination of rhesus negative blood but raises positive antibodies. So it means that I wouldn't get a react, like a raises negative mother wouldn't get a reaction to that blood, but he, it, you can still get rid of those um, antigens from the fetus. So it's just amazing. So statistically they've calculated how many doses and so on and figured out, I think I forget how many million babies. Was it 2.4 million 2. babies? 4. That, yeah. It's just baffling, isn't it? It's, it's just amazing. I mean, one of my nieces probably wouldn't be here without him. Yeah, my daughter wouldn't be here. 
Um, I mean, we had other, yeah, anyway, I- irrelevant. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like, and it's, it's just um, apparently 17% of pregnant women receive it. It's just fantastic. There are, and I hadn't realised that this anti-D serum relied on essentially blood donations. So, and especially so much from one person. Um, apparently the whole program to create anti-D, it's not going to collapse. Uh, there are 160 donors, but it must be really difficult to identify and then recruit these donors. It's such a rare thing. Yeah, so I just thought that was such an amazing story. Um, it reminded me of you know, that is. I need to get back to donating blood and and not just because of like the obvious things like someone in a car crash or someone giving birth who's lost a lot of blood, but all these other kinds of treatments that depend on donated blood products that you might not even necessarily think of. So I was happy to hear that he was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia. Very deserving. Yeah. Definitely. Donating blood is not like, you know, it's a bit more than just sitting back and having a cookie at the end. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal and and the commitment to keep doing that, it's just amazing. So, yeah. You know, the interesting bit was they said they're now trying to come up with a project to see if they can mm. replace him by harvesting some of his DNA, his white blood cells, and they're seeing if they can find the ones that are responsible for producing this antibody. Um, and so if they can create an immortal cell line version of this um, and then just harvest the antibodies directly um, from in vitro rather than having to get it from him. Mm. So it sounds like they're kind of at the start of the project so far. So hopefully that's a success. Yeah, because I was sort of wondering, would it ever be possible to make a synthetic version of these antigens that we could, without relying on people to give blood, um, who just happen to have that Mm. ability? Because, yeah, that would be... Very cool if we could do it in a lab. Yeah, I mean, this must be a global issue. Mm. Yeah, I was wondering. Absolutely. So I'm almost surprised that it just says that the Australian Blood Service is interested in mm. this when maybe he has the best um, antibody that they've come across in the world as well. There was one interesting uh, sentence that I saw, which was when they were talking about how many um, donations he's given, where they said, you know, he gave blood almost every mm. week um, donating his blood plasma. And he retires with 1,162 donations from his right arm and 10 from his left. It's like, uh, we just, we couldn't be bothered with the left hand. That wasn't as good as the right. (laughs) Maybe he was left-handed and he didn't want to have his... um, Yeah, they don't normally take it from your dominant hand because you're using that. Uh, When I've given it, it's actually been the other way. Really? That my Ah. right arm, it just goes faster. So I'm right-handed, but I've... I tried giving it for my left one, so it just it took a lot longer oh, okay. than doing a donation for my right arm. So maybe his veins there are just better. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I and mean, if you're doing it every week, I think you'd be optimizing yeah, you would. to make this as efficient as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Our next story is kind of a disturbing one uh, about the letter written by or signed by 60 representatives from 26 countries addressed to the World Health Organization, calling for more action to fight the cancer-causing retrovirus HTLV-1. Carolyn, I'd never heard of this problem, but it's actually a pretty common one, especially for the indigenous population in Australia who uh, don't have much support against this, and it's quite a bad problem, isn't it? Yeah, I also feel like I should have heard a lot more about this disease since I've read more about it. Um, so HTLV-1 stands for human T lymphotrophic virus. It's a related virus to HIV. Um, it's also a retrovirus. Um, and so it was disco- in fact discovered before HIV and it could be spread through contaminated blood, unprotected sex and breast milk. Um, one of the scary things it does is it can develop into quite an aggressive leukemia. It might be understudied, um, in some ways, because it can take quite a long time for symptoms to appear. In some people, it can be up to 30 years um, before they realise, before something bad happens from it. However, once a leukaemia develops, it's really fast moving, and most people who develop it are dead within the year. And then aside from this, it can also cause lung and kidney and spinal problems. So it sounds pretty nasty for something that people Mm. just haven't heard about. 
So how does it cause cancer? So it's a retrovirus, meaning that it's made of RNA, but it can integrate its genetic code back into the host cell genome as DNA. And so once it's there, it expresses some cells, which t- some genes, which tell the cells to stop listening to signals telling them to die if its genome gets damaged. So this helps the virus out because it can stay there longer undetected. Um, but it also means that mutations can accumulate in those cells. And the longer that it's there for, the more chance there is that one of these mutations can lead to cancer. So this might be a bit of a reason for the long startup time before the leukemias start to occur. Right. So scientists think that um, maybe 20 million people worldwide have this disease. Um, so I think Japan, um, where they've actually probably got a pretty good public health program looking at dropping the transmission rates, and they're working on a vaccine. Um, it's also in Brazil, sub-Saharan Africa, and as you were saying, in Central Australia, in the Indigenous populations. So there, there's no vaccine yet for it? No, so. no vaccine yet. Do we know why then that discrepancy is, why it tends to be the Indigenous populations and, and just certain populations in some countries? Why is it not a more widespread problem for the rest of the population? I mean, I'm not sure what the connection between Central Australia and Japan and things like this, but I mean, maybe it affects um, people of particular genetic backgrounds. But also I think the Central Australia problem is that it might um, affect people who have particular health issues. Um, And um, we know that there is a real um, health problem with people in Indigenous communities, which um, the Close the Gap initiative is working to help close um, the difference between Indigenous life expectancy and the rest of Australia. Um, and this is probably one of the contributing factors. Yeah, it's 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 just odd. I think also um, one of the things I've uh, learned about this is, as you say, this was discovered a few years before HIV was, but HIV got a lot more attention and a lot more focus, and rates of that HIV infection have dropped dramatically since the 1980s. Uh, but again, this is just sort of flown under the radar, even though we've known about. HTLV1, it hasn't received as much focus and attention, which is obviously why these uh, experts have written to the WHO for this. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it stayed within communities which don't have quite as strong access to media um, who can't advocate for themselves as strongly. Hmm. So in Central Australia and some communities, they found that up to 45% of people are infected, um, which is kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, But one of the problems is we don't actually know what the real prevalence is as testing has actually been so limited. Those numbers are coming from a recent research project um, by a group at the Baker Institute um, because the test is not funded by Medicare and can cost $170 per patient, which is a pretty massive cost um, for someone in one of these communities particularly for something which may be asymptomatic for decades. You think there's something better they can do with the money right now. Yeah. So the testing that has been done, it's by done by this research um, group, and it can take up to six months to get the results back. So this is, I think, yeah, pretty disturbing for me that there isn't a public test available. I mean, that's got to be a pretty high priority for the federal government to sort that out. Um, and alongside the testing, you need to be able to spread information about how to prevent transmission amongst um, people and have that available in a non-stigmatizing fashion. Yeah, because I think that's the, been the main uh, solution with HIV, wasn't it? It was just public awareness, safe sex, blood transfusions, that sort of stuff. It, it's, it's knowledge and education that's really brought that down. Maybe we need to do a big initiative for that with HTLV1. As well as, as you say, that testing, that's ridiculously expensive and six months waiting time to find out if maybe in 30 years you'll get leukemia as well. It's a difficult situation. Well, in the meantime, you know, breastfeeding mothers could have it and not realise that they're passing it on to their babies. Exactly. Yeah. Let's hope the, uh, the letter has some effect and someone reads it and more action is taken. Well, let's move on and uh, let's finish off with some non-blood-related yeah. <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a theme. Uh, oh, it's been a great addition here. Love it. <laughs> Penny, I'm fascinated by this. It's mm. just a brief little story in Scientific American. 
uh, a theory that some archaeologists have come up for that say Neanderthals were uh, very good at navigating the seas. They were a seafaring race. So what's the theory? Yeah, I yeah. found this quite fascinating too. Um, the idea is that looking at some of stone tools that are found on Mediterranean islands, so things like Crete and Naxos, um, they're lodged in ancient soils, so really ancient and they can't be dated directly because they're too old. So all sorts, you know, all the techniques that we use to date artifacts just don't go to that age. But what you can do is put them into a rough chronology with other um, tools based on the style and sophistication. So that's a pretty commonly used technique of um, dating stuff in archaeology. Often it's just not practical to get, you know, a carbon date or some other kind of... Um, you know, real data-driven date. So you have to look at typology and technology. Mm. So I think most of us, and the, the analogy they gave is you could probably look at a car and go, oh, yeah, that's a modern car or Ugh, that looks like it was from the 80s or the 60s or the 20s. Like you can <laughs> tell. And, yes, someone could make a replica 1920s car today, but it's not likely. You don't think ancient human had an obsession with vintage? I know. Like these could have been like real retro hypster um <laughs> people. just love neanderthal style. i know it's so classic right <laughs> <laughs> really archaic um so these implements so these clues like the style the soils that they're found in suggest that they could go back to the middle paleolithic which places them between sort of fifty thousand and two hundred thousand years ago which is before homo sapiens showed up so that suggests that the people who made them were Neanderthal and if so, then they must have been sailing on the sea. I mean, this is, of course, speculation. That's a long, it, you know, mm. it's a lot to draw from some stone tools which aren't solidly dated. But it is a really interesting thought because I would say, and it's, you know, sailing a boat, is quite a cognitively complex activity. You're not just um, make you know getting on a log and floating out into the ocean. We're not talking like we're talking the Mediterranean and just seeing what happens. Like there's planning, there's navigation. Um, you would assume there'd be cooperation, which has implications for the kind of language they might have. So if this is true, and no one's found any boats, we've just got the evidence of the tools. I mean that could really get us to really rethink what we understand about Neanderthal capabilities. Hmm. I, I thought that was fascinating. I mean, I'm sh I'm, I'd am i like to follow this a bit and see if anyone comes and goes, oh, no, no, we think it's they're only 10,000 years old because of this or that. Hmm. But it, it's, just, it's yeah. just a fascinating idea and I, I think it's something that is really interesting. Whether the sea levels are a little bit different then. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, was there a land bridge yeah. or something? And I mean, I'm just going to assume, I haven't read the original study that that's been ruled out, that they just walked there. But um, it is quite fascinating. I always think, like, one, something that's always fascinated me is the Polynesian migrations to those islands and just the amount of skill that it took and that people have displayed to get to really isolated places like Easter Island. Yeah, they're massive migrations, I think it's a cool. It's, we're also we are speculating a lot. That, oh, it's huge uh, speculation. You know, and, and when we talk about you know, oh, they must have been good at navigating. They must have planned it well and everything. We're also assuming that it wasn't pure random luck that got them to that island, and there might have been thousands of uh, attempts that or didn't get there. Or even a whole heap of Homo so. sapiens doofuses who were really just bad at making tools and got stranded there and buried <laughs> their crappy tools. Like I don't know. Presumably that's been yeah, like. Presumably this is not insane enough that everyone has just dismissed it out of hand. It's, it's worth considering and it's interesting to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I like this one too. Very good. I think that's our show. As usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 296. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and supporting us on Patreon. But the best way you can help us out is by telling your friends about us, posting on Facebook, social media. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Carolyn DeGraff. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been fun. 
And as always, thank you, Penny, for joining us. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. What other factors have caused the sea levels to rise relative to dry land? Does anyone else have any? If you're referring to ground subsidence, uh, that is a factor in some regions. Okay, what else? That's one. So now we've gotten two. What else? Ground subsidence is not going to cause uh, the levels of sea level rise that arouse my concern. I'm just asking for factors. I would not. I was not asking for your prioritizing of one over the other. But you've mentioned two. What else? Those are all that I know of. What about erosion? Every single year that we're on Earth, you have huge tons of silt deposited by the Mississippi River, by the Amazon River, by the Nile, by every major river system, and for that matter, creek, all the way down to the smallest systems. And every time you have that soil or rock, whatever it is that is deposited into the seas, that forces the sea levels to rise because now you've got less space in those oceans uh, because the bottom is is moving up. Um, what about um, I'm, I'm pretty the, sure the that White that's Cliffs a, of Dover, uh, California, uh, where you have the waves crashing against the shorelines, and time and time again you're having the cliffs crash into the sea. All of that displaces water, which forces it to rise, does it not? I, I'm pretty sure that on human timescales, those are minuscule uh, effects.